Okay, I think we'll, we'll get started. Um, thank you so much for everyone for joining. Um, and it's my pleasure to host today, Dr. Joanna Wysoka, right? <laughs> or, or, or Joanna Wysoka. Yeah, very, very good, very good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, Dr. Wysoka uh, did her, her undergrad and master's at Warsaw University um, in Poland, and then she did her PhD um, in the Polish Academy of Sciences and Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Uh, she then completed a Damon Runyon postdoctoral fellowship in David Alice's lab at Rockefeller University. Um, and then she joined in, in 2006, she joined the Stanford Department of Chemical and Systems Biology and rapidly established herself as a pioneer in the field and, a leader, <laughs> and a, a leader of creative innovating team, diverging from her postdoctoral work and adapting numerous systems to understand the mechanisms by which covalent histone modifications regulate gene expression patterns during vertebrate development and differentiation, and also broadly looking at the mechanisms of chromatin regulation in embryonic stem cells, the molecular basis of pluripotency, and the role of histomethyltransferases in cell fate decisions. So Dr. Rosoka is an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and is a named Lori Loki Endowed Professor at Stanford University's School of Medicine. Among her many recognitions have been the Serial Scholar Award, the Vilcek Prize for Creative Promise, and the election as a member of the National of the American Academy of Arts and Science. And among her numerous contributions to science, um, which you know, many of us are very familiar with, um, most notable is her mentorship of talented scientists who have gone on to establish their own successful labs and postdoctoral trainings. And today we are privileged to have Dr. Soka join us as our postdoc invited speaker. In today's talk, she'll focus on one of the most fascinating cell types, I think, and, and I think she thinks, that great the, to interrogate the acquisition and loss of pluripotency. Thank you so much for joining us and for meeting with our students and postdocs, and we welcome you and look forward to an amazing talk. Thank you very much for your invitation. It's, it's good to visit, even though only virtually. I have my friends in the department, and it's, it's, it's really great. Uh, to catch up with, with some of you at least a, a little bit. I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Okay, let's see, where is my PowerPoint? Okay. All right, can you see it? Yes, great. Thank you. So just very broadly, my lab is interested in understanding how biological information is integrated on chromatin. In other words, how regulatory information that is encoded by the DNA is read in the context of the cellular history by the lineage specific transcription factors and in the context of the signaling environment of the cell by signaling effectors of, of, of or chromatin effectors of signaling pathways and how these three layers of information, DNA, cellular history, and signaling environment work together to produce permissive or restrictive chromatin states, which in turn allow for very precise spatial temporal control of gene expression during development and tissue homeostasis. And as many of you know from, from work of several people in the department, much of the signal integration occurs at cis regulatory elements such as promoters, enhancers, silencers, boundary elements. And of those, enhancers play a privileged role in mediating cell type specific gene expression programs. Again, I think that enhancers necessarily need an introduction in this department, but uh, let me just state that these are modular genetic elements that are able to activate or enhance expression of their target genes over large genomic distances. And their characteristic is they're often specialized for, for directing expression in a specific tissue context. And in our lab, we're interested both in the basic biology and fundamental principles of mammalian gene regulation, as well as how enhancers impact human biology. So on the basic side, we're really interested in questions like how enhancers can their target over very long genomic distances. How do they regulate transcriptional bursts? Uh, many of you may know that transcription uh, is, uh, 
is a discontinuous process that occurs in bursts and how this bursty process nevertheless allows for achieving precision and robustness of gene regulation during development. And finally, given my background, we're also very much interested in the role of the chromatin context uh, plays in, in gene regulation. But we're also interested in cis-regulatory variation in human biology. In particular, we want to understand how change in enhanced sequence or function gives rise to the gene expression divergence, which in turn allows for phenotypic variation, either between species, so what makes us within a species, what makes us individual, and how changes in enhancer sequence and, fu and function can lead to disease. And today I will start from discussing the role of, of non-coding enhancer mutation in disease. Then I will move on to the uh, within species normal range individual variation. And finally, in the last part of, uh, of my talk, I will switch gears a little bit and talk about the neural crest plasticity and how neural crest is able to acquire uh, this ex enormous expanded differentiation potential during development. So in the first uh, part of my talk, I'll focus on SOX9 as a model locus to study non-coding regulatory mutations in, in, in disease. And this work has been led by a very talented postdoc in the lab, uh, Hannah Long. So, uh, SOX9 is a developmentally important description factor involved in many different processes, various tissues and organs, and its haploinsufficiency is associated with a multisystemic disorder called campomelic dysplasia. Uh, campomelic dysplasia has a variety of manifestations, including long bone defects, uh, other skeletal anomalies, craniofacial defects, um, uh, and also male to female sex reversal. What is, what is interesting from MERS in this huge gene desert over 2.5 megabase large gene desert where it's a, it's a single je, uh, gene immersed in, in this large genomic space and that non-coding mutations within this gene desert recapitulate some or select aspects of campomelic dysplasia in the absence of uh, other manifestations. So for example, uh, mutations in this part of the gene desert are associated with sex reversal only, whereas mutations at this very end of the gene desert uh, are associated with isolated craniofacial defects. And these craniofacial defects are referred to as the Pierre Robin sequence. It's called sequence because there's a sequence of events. The, the primary defect is underdeveloped lower jaw or micrognatia. And this in turn or in sequence leads to secondary manifestations like tongue falling back in the throat, resulting in breathing and feeding problems in, in, in patients. Uh, and in subset of patients, there is also a, a secondary cleft palate resulting from the underdevelopment uh, of the lower jaw. So Hannah hypothesized that Pierre Robin sequence of PRS is an enhancer of PATI, and then the far end of the gene desert in SOX9 harbors enhancers that regulate SOX9 expression specifically during craniofacial development, and therefore uh, we only have craniofacial but not other manifestations associated with, with these genomic deletions. And I should say that Stan Lionet, when, when he originally mapped uh, PRS mutations, he actually put forth the same hypothesis that these locus will harbor enhancers that regulate SOX9, but this hypothesis has been met with a, with a great deal of skepticism in the, in the treatment genetics uh, community because of this humongous distance between the PRS region and and the SOX9 gene. So before I tell you how Hannah went about testing this hypothesis, uh, I need to remind you that cranial neural crest cells are the major cell type of origin for the developing human face. So these uh, cells form early in development, they're uh, induced within the ectoderm, and then they uh, undergo epithelial to mesenchymal transition, they delaminate, migrate in long distances and their destinations, they are able to differentiate to a large variety 
connective cell types, including bone, cartilage, and connective to the head and face, such that the craniofacial structures are in fact derived from the craniofacial crest cells. And while this process occurs early in development, uh, we can recapitulate at least some aspects of it in, in the human context in vitro, starting from human embryonic stem cells or iPS cells and differentiating them in vitro to cranial neural crest cells or even further differentiating them to a more terminal uh, cell type such as cranial chondrocytes or osteoblasts. And importantly for the purpose of this talk, SOX9 is expressed and plays a role at multiple stages uh, of neural crest development. First, it's important for neural crestal specification and expansion of, uh, of uh, CNCCs, but it's also a master regulator of chondrogenesis. It's important development of the, of the cranial cartilage and cartilage also elsewhere in, in the body. And this expression pattern is recapitulated in our in vitro model, uh, both in cranial neural crest cells and chondrocytes that we derive from them. So to identify candidate PRS reg associated regulatory elements, Hannah looked back at our epigenomic maps where we, where we mapped uh, uh, chromatin signatures associated with regulatory elements during human uh, ESL differentiation to cranial neural crest cells. And she started looking for elements that first are activated during the transition from uh, uh, human ESLs to cranial neural crest cells at the SOX9 locus, but also that overlap at least one of the deletions that have been mapped in, in, in PRS patients. And she identified at this very far end of the gene desert, three uh, candidate clusters of enhancers. And now I'm gonna zoom in. Um, and we call them clusters because there's more than uh, one P300 uh, peaks uh, in, in each of, uh, of those regions, suggesting separable, uh, separate uh, regulatory elements within, within each of those uh, regions. So we call those candidate clusters based on their distance from the SOX9 promoter. So EC1.45 is located 1.45 megabase away from SOX9 promoter. EC1.35 is 1.35 megabase away, et cetera. So these are really enormous distances. Which of course begs a question whether these elements can really make contacts with SOX9 promoter over such large regions. And indeed they can. So now I'm showing you a capture C assay, which is a version of, of chromosomal capture assay, uh, which uh, essentially looks at the long range interactions from a specific viewpoint. In this case, our specific viewpoint is SOX9 promoter. And already in ES cells, you see that the SOX motor is sampling a whole large logically associated domain. Uh, but there are also some speaks uh, that, that you can see which are indicative of uh, enriched frequency for long range interactions. And those, just for your curiosity, uh, overlap with CTCF binding sites. Uh, and there are multiple internal CTCF binding sites within this tab. But what you can also see is when we differentiate to cranial neural crest cells, we see enhanced or an, uh, frequency of interactions with these three putative PRS locus uh, enhancer elements, EC1.45, 3.5, and 1.25 uh, with uh, actually one caveat that for EC1.35, we actually already see some interactions prior to, to differentiation. And in this case, this EC1.35 also uh, overlaps with a strong CTC, a constitutive CTC of binding site. So just to summarize, indeed this candidate locus enhancers uh, are able to make this very long range contacts with SOX9 promoter. And we also done capture Cs for numerous other promoters in, the, in this whole chromosomal regions, for example, case KCNJ2, which is much closer to PRS locus, and we don't detect, but it's uh, located in a different TAD, and we don't detect interactions of the PRS locus uh, enhancers with any other gene but SOX9. But the real question is whether PRS locus enhancers can really regulate SOX9 expression. And to address this, uh, Hannah generated in vitro heterozygous enhancer deletion lines. Uh, 
uh, where she deleted uh, each of the enhanced for clusters on one allele and the other allele remained wild type. So for simplicity, I will just now sh show EC1.45 uh, from, from now on, but we also have a support for EC1.25 uh, playing a role uh, in, in regulation of SOX9 expression and EC1.35 for curiosity is probably more of a structural element within this locus. So anyway, in the heterozygous human ES lines, she, did, she took those lines and differentiated them to cranial neural crest cells and then allele specific expression analysis, uh, assaying expression both on the allele at, uh, that had wild tap uh, EC1.45 versus uh, the enhancer cluster. And what she saw is that there is a defect in SOX9 expression already early in the initiation of the cranial neural crest cells, but it becomes stronger with 50 to 55% loss of SOX9 expression on the affected allele uh, uh, associated with, with enhancer deletion. Interestingly, however, when we differentiate these same cells to chondrocytes, this allylic skew disappears. And this is interesting because there is even higher expression of SOX9 in chondrocytes and I already mentioned as a master regulation of chondrogenesis. But this suggests that PRS locus enhancers are regulating SOX9 expression in cranial neural crest cells, but not in chondrocytes. And this is uh, consistent with the fact that these enhancers are decommissioned during chondrogenesis. So here you look at ataxy signals uh, and you see that the, the enhancers in, within EC1.45 uh, cluster become, become hypersensitive in cranial neural crest cells but are then decommissioned uh, during chondrogenesis. So this defines a window for, for disease etiology because there are no chondro, uh, chondrocyte specific uh, regulators, uh, enhancers uh, that regulate SOX9 expression in the PRS locus, suggesting the disease originates really in cranial neural crest cells prior to differentiation. Hannah has also done a lot of enhancer bashing. And just to summarize this, she, she was able to show that for EC1.45, there are actually two minimal regions that are, are recap, able to recapitulate almost full enhancer activity. And each of those minimal regions is actually very poor enhancer by itself, but they show striking synergistic activity. And both activity and the synergy of those two minimal regions are dependent on the coordinator motif, which is a long sequence motif shown here. We actually identified this motif a while back when we've done the comparative analysis of human and chimp cranial neural crest cells with a goal of identifying enhancers that change their regulatory activity during recent human evolution. And because human and chimp genomes are so similar, we will able to start identifying sequences that can explain divergence of enhancer activity between human and chimp. And from this analysis, a, a lot of transcription factor motifs emerged, uh, both novel, uh, such as coordinator and, and known transcription factor motif. But of those, the coordinator was much more predictive of enhancer activity change than any other motif. And we called it coordinator because we hypothesized at the time that this motif will play an outsized role in coordinating enhancer activity within the context of cranial neural crest cells. And this prediction is now really uh, bearing out to, to be true, at least in the context of these uh, pure urban locus enhancers, but also we have some other evidence as well. So here, just to give you a little bit of flavor of the data, you see that uh, the two peaks recapitulate cluster activity, and we take two minimal regions within the main P300 peaks. Uh, we also see almost full recapitulation, uh, recapitulation of activity, but each of those minimal regions is a very poor enhancer. I want to uh, uh, bring your attention to the fact that this is a logarithmic scale. And mutating the coordinator motifs, one motif in minimal region two and three motifs in, minim uh, in minimal region one and three motifs in minimal region two, uh, essentially completely kills uh, enhancer activity almost to the, to the background levels. So just to summarize this part of the talk, what I've shown you is that enhancers fall with P300 
Alaka's deletion region regulates SOX9 during a defined window of craniannular crest cell development that are decommissioned during chondrogenesis, and that these represent some of the longest range, in fact, the longest range functional enhancers that have been described today for the human genome. And they join uh, other examples, such as a canonical example of sonic hedgehog limb enhancer located one megabase away from the sonic hedgehog gene that, that can be used as a paradigm to study gene regulation at, at the very long distances. And I've also shown you that coordinator motif, which we discovered through evolutionary comparisons, plays a key role in regulating EC1.45 and, and other PRS cluster uh, activity. So in the next part, I want to ask whether we can model it in vivo, and in particular, whether we can understand the mechanism that underlies specificity of disease manifestations, because PRS is indeed very specific disease. Not only are manifestations restricted to the face, they're in fact further restricted to the lower jaw. And in enhanceropathies, the general view is that the specificity of the disease comes from the specificity of the enhancer. In other words, enhancers have a restricted uh, spatial temporal activity, therefore loss of enhancer will only affect the, the gene function in a particular tissue. So we were in fact very pleased to see that when we tested activity of PRS enhancers, we saw that they're active there are beautiful new facial enhancers. So here we're testing human EC1.45 uh, in the context of, of mouse uh, transgenic embryos, and you can see there's a beautiful craniofacial activity. But this activity is actually not restricted to the lower jaw, which is the, the, the craniofacial structure that is affected in disease. So that raises a question, where is this additional layer of specificity coming from? that results in disease manifestations that are restricted to the lower jaw, but, but not affecting other craniofacial structures. So to make a long story short, additional layer specificity comes from the sensitivity, preferential sensitivity of the lower jaw to the gene dosage. So to characterize phenotypes of SOX9 dosage perturbation, specifically in the mouse neural crest, uh, we took advantage of the uh, mouse neural crest uh, specific uh, driver and generated uh, uh, heterozygous knockouts, followed by um, a quantitative phenotyping and micro CT analysis of, of skulls, morphometric landmarking, both of the mandible and other skull elements, and quantitative analysis of shape changes and compared between the genotype. So, what we saw is that 50% reduction in SOX9 gene dosage in the mouse neural crest shows well recapitulates PRS phenotypes. And we see both the, the uh, hypogna hypognatia, which is a characteristic um, uh, feature of, of PRS, but we also see uh, changes in, in mandible, in, in, in mandible uh, shape, uh, which are uh, shown masked here, that are associated with 50% reduction in the SOX9 dosage, and that are also have been observed in the patients. And in fact, when we just take the mandible shape in the cons uh, into consideration and the principal component analysis, we can very well separate the genotype just looking at the mandible shape. So wild type from 50% SOX9 reduction separate beautifully uh, looking at the shapes of the mandible, but importantly, other skull elements are not affected. So this tells us that the, that the lower jaw is selectively sensitive to perturbation of SOX9 gene dosage and allows us to propose that the specificity of the PRS comes from two layers. One layer is the broad craniofacial enhancer activity of PRS locus enhancers, uh, which restrict the perturbation to the face and, and uh, uh, without affecting other organs. And second layer of specificity from the heightened sensitivity of the mandible to SOX9 gene dosage. And these two layers work together to result in this highly specific uh, uh, human disease that preferentially associate, is associated with micrognatia or, or um, small lower jaw. 
in the course of, 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 of this work, uh, we actually saw that uh, the mandible development is extremely sen sensitive to the SOX9 gene dosage of a very broad range. And that even very slight changes in gene dosage can have reproducible effects on facial morphology. So in this case, we're looking at enhancer mutant, uh, which results only in 10 to 13% reduction in SOX9 expression in the developing mouse face. And despite this very tiny uh, le level of per perturbation in SOX9 expression, we're still able to detect reproducible effects on facial morphology, which preferentially affects mandibular ramus with condylar and angular processes being significantly affected. And again, while this, this effect is much uh, less severe than 50% dosage reduction, we can still uh, do the principal component analysis and separate the genotypes, the wild type from enhancer mutant, just by looking at mandible shape. So what this tells us that for some genes, there's, there's extreme dosage sensitivity and then tiny changes in gene expression are able to produce uh, uh, are able to result in, in, in reproducible uh, phenotypes. So this raises a question whether facial variation in general, but in humans in particular, is encoded by enhancers. And the idea here is simple, is that the genetic variants that are present in the human populations will produce uh, a strong or weak enhancer allele. So for example, the SNPs can affect transcription factor binding sites, producing lower or higher affinity transcription factor binding sites, resulting in a stronger or weaker enhancers. And quite often this, uh, on a single enhancer level, this type of perturbation will only result in small changes in gene expression, again, on the level of 10, 20, 30%, but, but typically no more than that. And perhaps for most genes, in uh, really not be efficient to result in any measurable phenotypes. But for those genes that are uh, so dosage sensitive, as uh, I have shown you an example of SOX9, it will be actually sufficient to produce phenotypes that are associated with either strong or weak enhancer alleles. And if we combine this over many dosage sensitive loci and many enhancers, uh, for which we have underlying genetic variation, it will perhaps be sufficient to produce this glorious facial variation that we see within the human population. So is there actually any evidence for that? So for a while now, we've been working with a group of uh, human geneticists and image analysis people to try to understand genetic architecture of normal range human facial variation. And in particular, our collaborator, Peter Claes at the University of Leuven in, in Belgium, uh, developed a really innovative methods for multivariant fa facial phenotyping and GY. In this case, each fair represented as, as uh, uh, 10,000 coordinates on the dense, dash, dense mesh of quasi landmarks. And these coordinates are aligned uh, to establish correspondence between landmarks uh, 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 among the cohort. And then global to local fa spatial segmentation is performed. So looking both at the major effects on the face within those major four facial quad quadrants. So for example, forehead or lower jaw or nose shape going more towards in more uh, narrow and specific facial segments uh, such that each, each uh, shape is segmented into 63 segments corresponding to both the very global to very local effects on the face shape. And the shape analysis is, is done uh, comparing you know, the individuals within the cohort and then genome-wide association uh, studies are performed over each segment. And this allows for identifying genomic regions uh, that are associated or GWAS peaks that are associated with, with variation of specific uh, facial regions, both global effects on the face shape as well as very local effects on, on specific aspects of the face shape. 
And the power of the census depends on the color that, that you have to detect these differences. And, and in uh, over 10,000 uh, individuals of uh, European ancestry, uh, we now have 203 facial GWAS peaks associated with these different aspects of variation. But what we're interested in is how this variation co comes about mechanistically during the development. And uh, first question that we ask is when uh, are these, when and where are these facial variation GWAS uh, uh, peaks or other underlying genomic regions, uh, when and where are they decorated by active chromatin marks? So we, we analyzed over 300 different cell types representing embryonic, adult, or in vitro derived cell types, as well as our uh, human craniangular crest cells, uh, as well as the craniofacial tissues from, uh, from human fetuses. And what we see is that, in fact, this GWAS peak is highly enriched uh, for active chromatin marks in human craniangular crest cells and in human embryonic facial tissue. So what this suggests that a lot of the variation, which in, in the GWAS studies is actually measured in adults, originals, originates early in developing, development during craniangular crest cell formation and, and differentiation. But now we can ask even further, what type of active chromatin in craniangular crest cells are these GWAS peaks associated with? And what we see is that these GWAS signals are enriched within enhancer elements, but not other classes of, of active regulatory elements, for example, promoters. And let me just give you an example of that. So here is a GWAS lead SNP on chromosome two, which is linked to jaw shape variation. And the, this is an extremely common variant. So probably half of, roughly half of you in the audience are uh, human-derived allele or A allele, and the other half are, are, have a T allele, T allele, which is an ancestral allele that is also shared with Neanderthals and chimps. And chimps have also some uh, other nucleotide changes in, within this, uh, this region. And if we look in our epigenomic maps right underneath, there is actually a craniannual crest cell enhancer uh, in this region. And interestingly, it has higher levels of H3K27 acetylations in chimps than in humans, suggesting that in fact, it's more, uh, the, the chimp version is more active than the human version. And indeed, this is the case and the, the uh, change is driven by the sequence, because when we test the either human-derived allele or ancestral allele or chimp allele, either in, in the context of the mouse transgenesis or luciferase assays in craniannual crest cells, we see that the human-derived allele is associated with loss of activity uh, in uh, the developing uh, jaws. But what is also really interesting in this about this particular variant is the very same variant is associated with susceptibility to non-syndromic cleft palate. Uh, so why is this interesting? It's interesting because of course not 50% of kids, I just told you this is extremely common variant, that 50% of kids are not born with cleft palate. And I've also shown you that so what this suggests is that either a combina combination of variants or interactions between genetics and environment, so in, in environmental perturbations like prenatal, prenatal exposure to a number of factors will determine the difference between the healthy normal range versus disease associated phenotype. So this is just one example that il illustrates the emerging themes that, that are, are slowly uh, emerging from, from this work, which is nowhere near completion. So first of all, genetic variants associated with face shape are highly enriched within neural crest enhancers. And we tested now enough examples to say that a substantial fraction affects regulator of, of these uh, uh, types with variation affect regulatory activity of enhancers. 
Something I didn't have time to talk about is that we can also reveal integration of developmental processes through analysis of shared common variation. And if you're interested, what I mean by that, I encourage you to look up our, our recent preprint on shared heritability of face and brain shape. What we also seeing that non-syndromic disease associated variants, and this is definitely true for, for, for cleft palate, and we're interested if this is also going to be true in, in other uh, places, uh, are also, uh, first of all, are very common in, 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 in uh, population and also influence normal range variation. So this really, uh, drives home this, this point, because this is so common and associated with normal range variation, this really tells us that the combination of variants or intersection of genetics with environmental influences will determine healthy versus disease phenotypes. And we're really interested in, in exploring this uh, in the future and trying to find such combinations and, and such crosstalk between genome and the environment. So in this part of our, my talk, uh, to summarize, I hope I, I convinced you that enhancers are not only key drivers of, of in transcriptional regulations, but they're also emerging as a key driver of diversity. And we're hoping that the lessons that, that we're learning in the human phase will be also broadly applicable to other aspects of, of human variation. All right. So in the second part of my talk, uh, I'll switch gears and, and focus on this question, how do neural crest cells expand their differentiation potential during development? So probably most of you are familiar with, this, with the concept of lineage restriction in, in development where cellular potential is gradually restricted during development. Uh, uh, early, early embryonic cells are pluripotent, or pluripotent and upon germ layer formation, uh, there's restriction into three ger germ layers and each of these germ layers produces a given set of, of, of tissues and organs. And this concept of lineage restriction has been famously illustrated by Conrad Waddington in his epigenetic landscape that became almost a cliche metaphor for, for the limit, lineage restriction paradigm in development. But cranial neural crest cells, which are of course a very amazing cell type on, on, on many levels, challenge this lineage restriction paradigm. And the reason why they do so, or well, I don't know what's the reason, but, but, but the, the, uh, they, <coughs> they expand their differentiation potential. They're very unusual in the sense that they expand their differentiation potential uh, as they form. So they are an ectodermally derived cell type that forms in the neuroepithelium, but then they can give rise not only to the uh, ectodermal cell types such as neurons and glia, but they also give rise to uh, all the variety of the mesenchymal cell types that are typically thought of mesodermal derivative. So bone, cartilage, smooth muscle, adipocytes, anywhere else in the body, these cell types are, are derived from the mesoderm except for in the cranial region where most of the mesenchyme is in fact derived from the cranial neural crest cells. So this raises a question, how do they do it? So how do they gain their developmental potential uh, development to produce all these typical uh, uh, mesodermal cell types? And this is the question that Antoine Zalk was really interested in uh, tackling uh, in, uh, in his postdoc project. I'll tell you how he's done it. I also want to, two pieces of information that will be relevant for understanding this talk. First of all, specification of the cranial neural crest cells uh, in the head region, in the mouse embryo, coincides with the onset of somatogenesis. Uh, and this is really uh, important because this allows us to stage this process very precisely. You may know that pair of somites uh, forms roughly every two hours in the mouse embryo and it's a very regular process. So we essentially are able to stage the embryos that are undergoing neural crest induction and specification using the somatic clock. 
And second, we're also able to genetically label this, the, um, um, uh, the neural crest population using genetic markers such as WINT1, which labels, uh, in this case, epithelial uh, uh, cranial neural crest cells prior to when they uh, emigrated, uh, under when epithelial to mesenchymal transition and emigrated. So this is an early neural crest marker. And it actually goes on, when one goes on for the first time uh, in the embryo, or we can detect uh, its expression at around three to four somite stages. So to, to characterize uh, mouse CNCC in, in, in an unbiased way, Antua undertook single cell RNA-seq approach, where he started from the four somite embryos, which is the first time point at which we detect WINT1 expression, all the way up to the 10 somites, uh, where most of the cranial neural crest cells have already emigrated. And in each case, uh, for, in, from each uh, dissect craniofacial tissue and enriched for uh, cranial neural crystals using PACs, single cell sorted, and has done single cell RNA-seq analysis. And uh, as it's typical in this type of analysis, we've done clustering and assigning identity to each cluster, and I'm not going to go into details of that. Uh, needless to say, we see sort of the three major populations of, of cells, one corresponding to several epithelial cranial neural crest cell clusters prior to when emigration occurred, we see a single cluster of delaminating cranial neural crest cells, and then again, a variety of mesenchymal cranial neural crest cell populations after the emigration has already occurred. And because we have internal clock this data, meeting clock, uh, and we, we can look at how these populations develop over time. And as you can see that uh, six somite stage is associated with massive delamination events. And at eight uh, to 10 somite stages, most of these delaminations have already occurred. But today I want to focus on a on single cluster that, co uh, that is composed almost exclusively of, of the earliest cells in which we detect for WINT1 expression at the fourth somite stage. And we hypothesize that these are uh, early CNCC precursor cells, because again, these, these are the earliest cells that we're able to, to, to label. And we started looking at the, at the gene expression signatures in, in these cells with a, the with a hope uh, of trying to understand how CNCC gain their developmental potential. And when we looked at the genera specific enriched uh, in this structure, we're actually really excited to see that uh, canonical pluripotency factors, including all four Yamanaka factors, are actually enriched in, uh, uniquely in this cluster. So OCT4, NANOC, and KLF4 are, are there. And SOX2 is also there, although in case of SOX2, this is not, not surprising because SOX2 is a neuropithelial, early neuropithelial marker and it's expressed in, in, in many of these neuropithelial clusters. So this was, of course, both surprising and exciting because of the seminal work from Shinya Yamanaka showing that this cocktail of transcription factors is in fact able to reprogram cells to, to, to more naive or more pluripotent state. So first we wanted to confirm that the expression of pluripotency factors indeed uh, occurs during neural crest development. And here we, we used RNA fish, both in whole mount and cross section. And indeed we see that uh, both OCT4 and NANOG are expressed in WINT1 positive cells arising in the dorsal neural fold where the neural crest forms. But this raised an, an interesting question, whether this is really a rep in vivo or a programming event. So uh, within the neuropithelium or factors are reactivated, allowing for reprogramming of the neural crest or naive state, or whether, is it, uh, whether it's retention that a subset of uh, cells uh, from the pluripotent embryo within the neuropithelium is retained uh, pluripotency 
uh, and these cells will uniquely form the neural crest. And in fact, the retention has been suggested uh, before by Carol LeBon lab to, to, to actually occur in the, in the frog. So which one is it in, in the mammalian system? Well, it turns out that it's actually reprogramming because OCT4 is dynamically re-expressed in embryo head folds at the onset of somatogenesis. So up to E7.5, uh, all epiblast cells of the early embryo express a 4 So we're looking here at OCT4 GFP, uh, OCT4 iris GFP embryos, uh, all cells in, in the epiblast express OCT4. Then at the, uh, when the head falls form, the head falls form actually without OCT4 expression. And then at the very onset of somatogenesis, we see re-expression OCT4 that appears already uh, at the zero site stage uh, and this, uh, this expression starts expanding more posteriorly by the two somite stage. And to summarize this and other data, we see that OCT4 is being re-expressed at, at, in the embryo head folds at zero to three somites. Then its expression is very transient. So WIND1 activation, WIND1 is activated at about four, uh, three to four cell mites. And there is uh, expression of both OCT4 and WIND1 in the very narrow window of four to six cell mites. And by eight cell mites, the OCT4 expression is already gone. It's dynamic in time, but also dynamic in space because we, we, we see actually anterior to posterior shift in OCT4 expression uh, that occurs between those, these two to six somite stage with first induction being the most anterior part of the embryo and then shifting more posteriorly. And this is consistent with the way neural crest is induced as shown by experiments uh, done by Marianne Bronner, which is the, starts first from the most anterior part of the embryo and, and then goes uh, in the more posterior region. Okay, so if, so if our hypothesis is correct, and our hypothesis is this OCT4 positive cells are a cranial neural crest cell precursor, then the lineage tracking should show that most of the craniofacial structures are derived from these OCT4 positive cells. So to address this question, uh, Antoine took, took advantage of this OCT4 CREER driver uh, and looked at OCT4 positive cells and their descendants, uh, uh, which become labeled upon tamoxifen induced recombination. And again, we can state very precisely when we think the, the, the labeling in initiation. Uh, and when we, the, the labeling initiated is initiated one to two somites early in somatogenesis, we see that descendants of OCT4 cells. Uh, essentially label the majority of the facial mesenchyme and craniofacial structures, including frontonasal mass and uh, first branchial arch. And when we induce this recombination a little later at five to six somite stage, we actually see a posterior shift in the, in the craniofacial structures that are labeled uh, name others less labeling in the front nasal mass and more labeling in the second branchial arch. And this is again consistent with this transient wave of OCT4 expression that occurs in prospective CNCC going from anterior to posterior. But if we wait a little longer, uh, we never actually see the trunk neural crest cells being, being labeled. So we think that phenomenon is really unique to the cranial neural crest cells. At later stages of recombinations, the only cells that we see uh, are, uh, labeled are actually uh, PGCs. Okay, so this was the labeling of the OCT4 positive precursors. So what when we ablate this population? So when we ablate this OCT4 uh, positive precursor population, we actually see a loss, massive loss of, of facial structures. And this phenotype is very severe and in fact resembles cranial neural crest cells ablation phenotypes that have been reported before. So what this tells us is that indeed the OCT4 positive precursors give rise to 
and craniofacial stress, but it doesn't tell us any whether ox actually or any of those pluripotency factors is actually required for craniofacial development uh, and for reprogramming of, uh, of cranial crest cells to, to this multipotent differentiation state. So to test this, Antua turned into uh, uh, into OCT, uh, OCT for inducible OCT4 knockout. And what we saw is that it, OCT4 is not required for either induction uh, of cranial crest cells or for wind one expression in the neuroepithelium. So neuroepithelial cranial crest cells form just fine and are induced just fine. When we analyze phenotype you know, slow development uh, at E95, we see that while uh, neuroglial derivatives of cranial neural cells are not affected, there is a strong effect on, on ectomesenchyme uh, with defect in specification, proliferation, and uh, highly increased apoptosis of the ectomesenchyme. So again, I'm not going to walk you in, uh, over all the, all the details, but the reason why we thought this was extremely exciting is that it links directly the function of the pluripotency factor of OCT4 to the expansion of cranial crest cell potential to include this mesenchymal derivatives that are typical of, of mesoderm. So in other words, we can really say that the cranial crest cells expand their developmental potential by undergoing an in vivo reprogramming event and inducing the uh, Yamanaka factors, which then contribute to the acquisition uh, of additional developmental potential. So molecularly, we still know very little about this process in part because it, it's extremely transient and we can only get 40 to 50 cells uh, of this cranial oct for positive cells in, for, per, per embryo. But we have some uh, insights from the ataxic analysis that we have done on this cranial oct for positive cells that, that have been uh, sorted from four to six somite stage, stage embryos. And at the same time, there's another population uh, in the embryo that also expresses oct for in the trunk. There's a, um, neuromesodermal precursors or axial progenitors. And we also sorted that population for relative comparisons. And we were really interested how this uh, cranial and trunk oxidative cells, uh, how do they compare to cell types in the embryo in time. And we were greatly facilitated by, by the fact that Pihuan Sala published earlier this, uh, this year, Atlas of Single Cell Ataxiosis, uh, of from 20,000 of E85 mouse animals, that's, that's from the, exactly the same stage that, that we were looking at with our four to six somite M. We took all of this data, also included a number of other oxidative uh, cells, including pluripotent cells like uh, ESC, epiblast-like cells of EPLC and epiblast stem cells or EPSC. So uh, how, how do our cranial oct cells compare? So first of all, they cluster away trunk oct cells. Cluster together with uh, rectoderm and crest, which makes perfect sense given the, the, the developmental origins of these cells. But surprisingly, they also cluster together with epiblast stem cells, but not with other pluripotent stem cell, cell, cell types like ESC or IPSC. And this is shown here on this principal component analysis, where we only compare OCT4 positive populations. And you, as you can see, cranial OCT4 cells cluster together with EPSCs. And in fact, when we start comparing the distal ataxic peaks between cranial OCT4 and EPSC, two thirds of these distal ataxic peaks are overlapping be be between these two populations, which may at least in part explain sort of the, the expanded developmental potential of this cranial OCT4 cells. 
But the cranial octopore cells also have a unique set of peaks that are not present in any of these other octopore positive populations. And when we do the Gauten analysis on these peaks, we actually see that, that uh, they are associated with neural crest differentiation, development, cranial skeletal development, et cetera. So that's, that's highly encouraging. But then we started looking at what associations. And what we saw is that these are genes that are not yet expressed in, in any of the epithelial clusters of cranial neural crest cells prior to migration, uh, including oct for positive uh, cells. But rather, these are genes that are expressed later in migratory and mesenchymal cranial neural crest cells that are, that are expressed uh, at later stages of development. And this is shown here. So here we're looking at cranial oct uh, cell specific peak. As you see, it's unique to, to this population. And it's actually in an intron of the MEF2C gene, which is expressed in mesenchymal CNCC, but not in any of the epithelial clusters, and definitely not expressed together with, with OCT4. And moreover, this, uh, this peak has been previously shown to act uh, as an enhancer, which is active in migratory and mesenchymal cranial neural crest cells, so at later stages of development. So what is going on? So what we see going on, that the subs of these answers that are associated with the migratory mesenchymal CNCC fates are already open or primed for activation in cranial OCT4 precursors. And this perhaps, although again, it, it will require further mechanistic work, but this perhaps could explain why OCT4, which is only expressed very early and very transiently in epithelial CNCC, why it may be required for acquisition of mesenchymal fates by, by CNCC. So to summarize, uh, the take home message from the second part is that the single cell RNA-seq analysis identified CNCC precursor population and these precursors transiently reactivate pluripotency factors and share regulatory features with pluripotent uh, APS-C. I've also shown you that open chromatin landscape of CNCC precursors show priming or what we think is priming for subsequent migratory neural crest programs. And finally, the CNCC precursors and OCT4 itself are essential for ectomesenchyme formation and craniofacial development. And with this, I will finish and, and thank people who, who've done the work. Uh, Hannah Long has led the SOX9 project, uh, but she was helped by a fantastic set of collaborators, including Lichia Soleri at UCSF, Axel Wieser and Belkin Labs, uh, and Doug Higgs has hosted Hannah in, in his lab to, to learn Capture C. We have fantastic set of collaborations for the facial GWAS studies, Peter Clays, Mark Shriver, and Seth Weinberg. And uh, Antoine Zalk has led the, the, uh, uh, the neural crest pluripotency project and he called for single cell RNA-seq analysis. He's been helped uh, greatly by Rahul Singha in Ur Weissman's lab at Stanford. And I also want to acknowledge Tomek, Javed and Sahin from, from my lab that contributed to, to, to various uh, analysis that are shown in, uh, that were shown in this talk. So thank you very much for listening. And then I stop sharing my screen. That was so great, uh, Joanna. Thank you so much. Uh, so now we'll open this up to questions from trainees, if there are any. I know Antonio posted one question, but if there's any trainees um, first. So Anupama, do you want to unmute yourself? Uh, can you ask? Yeah. Hi. Uh, sorry, trying to start video, but I cannot somehow. Uh, so uh, yeah, I was going to ask, uh, so how are these like small sequence changes in the enhanced elements able to give you this graded effect, right? Like so many uh, gradations of gene dosage. And do you have some ideas of how exactly is it like access to transcription factors or even time of activation? And um, is it possible to have epigenetic effects on this particular angle? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so, so just to, to say, so in the 
it changes individual enhancers are usually actually leading to relatively small effect in gene dosage, but as I've shown you, even the small effect in gene dosage are already sufficient in some cases to produce the phenotype. In, in terms of disease, actually, like in PRS, as, as I've been showing you, the interesting aspect is that there can also be additive effects. So, for example, in some patients, we have loss of, of one cluster, uh, either EC1.45 or EC1.25, and those have, the patients have milder manifestations, whereas loss, some patients have the breakpoints that result in loss of both clusters or this whole arm of the, of, of uh, the, the, the very end of, of the gene desert, and those have more severe phenotypes. See additive effects from, from increased effects on, on gene dosage. But on the level of individual enhancers, those quite, and, and their natural genetic variation, those effects on gene dosage are quite often subtle, and they essentially arise from uh, changes that, that either decrease or increase affinity for particular transcription factors. And we actually, you know, see a set of transcription factors for which change in, in affinity is actually able to produce a relatively uh, large change in, in enhancer activity. Coordinator motif is actually one of the motifs that is most predictive of, of changes in enhancer activity. So, Yes, that's, that's, that's essentially uh, and the, the second part of it with other epigenetic influences. So we haven't done much work on, on, on this yet, but I think it's, it's really interesting this, this observation, this, the same variants regulate both normal range variation and disease associated variation. I really think it implies you know, either combinatorial effects or in gene environment interactions. And we know that for things like cleft palate, there are, you know, the prenatal exposure, the number of prenatal exposure, methyl donor deficiency, which, you know, feeds right into the epigenetics, maternal diabetes, alcohol, a number of influences that you can imagine play, you know, in, in, in an epigenetic way may actually exacerbate a weak enhancer allele phenotypes. So, so this is how we think about it, that th there can be epigenetic effects that will, could exacerbate or, uh, you know, gen genetically predisposed, let's say, weak, weak enhancer. And in some cases, it could, you know, lower gen gene dosage sufficiently to go, you know, below this, this uh, um, uh, you know, what separates the normal range from disease. Okay, thank you so much. And Sergio is going to unmute himself. Yeah, hi, Jana. Okay. Uh, great talk. Uh, I was wondering about the timing of expression of the pluripotency factors when they are reactivated in this mm -hmm. cranial uh, region and actually activation of the neural cross market. Like, do the pluripotency factor need to be switched off before the program starts, or could they be directly activating some of the neural cross markers, if that makes sense? So, so we see an overlap. So we, so we see that pluripotency factors are reactivated preceding the, the expression of WINT1, which is one of the earliest markers that, of the neural crest that we know. But then there is an, an, a time window of overlap where we see that both pluripotency factors and, and WINT1 are co-expressed in the same cells along with some early neuroepithelial neural crest markers. Now, you know, I, we have no, because the WINT1 is the earliest genetic markers for neural crest that we have, we kind of cannot go back now to be able to genetically label, you know, label the, 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 the neural crest in, uh, because the OCT4 and, and pluripotency factors get, get turned on early on. So I think our, our way would be to start thinking, what are the enhancers that are responsible for OCT4 and nanot expression in the, in the cranial region and try to mark this population at the earliest stages this way and, and, and this would allow, you know, uh, early, uh, e e going even earlier in, in the specification or induction event. Yeah, that's ultimately the, the biggest question, right? How's Stephen starting? Uh, Antonio, do you want to unmute yourself? 
Sure. Great seminar, Joanna. So I was wondering whether when you look at the human variation that is responsible for the facial features, did you look at all GWAS uh, and then analyze those that came up as responsible for facial features? Or did you focus on regions that were regulatory regions that were for genes, controlling genes that were expressed in the neural crest? No, so so we actually took all the all the GWAS all the GWAS signals, and the GWAS signal the GWAS peaks are all you know pretty much, you know we we are yet to find the coding variant. I mean I think it looks like it's all non-coding driven variation driven. So we take those those and obviously you know there's there's a, a LD region, but we take these regions, and and asked, essentially where you know, without making any assumptions what genes are near or any underlying genes, we asked in which cell types are these decorated by? Mm -hmm. And this is where we got very high enrichment for, for the high enrichment for neural crest and actually craniofacial tissues, including you know, the, the Jason Cotney, which I believe is his alumnus of your department, uh, also done some craniofacial mapping for, from early embryos. We, we saw enrichment in, in those tissues as well, which is not to say that all variation will come from the CNCC. You know, this mm -hmm. is where we see the highest enrichment and though we see many of these enhancers active. For sure, you know, there will be you know, other inputs. Uh, we also looking at uh, chondrocytes and osteoblasts, you know, the more, more derived, uh, mm, uh, more derived or more, more differentiated cell types. But even when we look at the, those more differentiated cell types, we see, we still see the highest enrichment in undifferentiated CNCC of those GWAS signals. So, it really seems that a lot of variation arises at this step of development. Yeah. And I wonder whether one can get more power of analysis if, if one does the analysis on the other way around, you know, like focusing on those genes expressed in the neural crest mm -hmm. and just looking at variation on regulatory regions for those genes uh, and, and specific facial features so that one can actually now link um, particular mutations to or, or changes in the DNA sequence to, mm -hmm. to those mm -hmm. facial features by gaining the power by restricting the space where one yeah. looks at. Yeah, I mean, obviously the, the GWAS uh, has sort of a one advantage of being fairly unbiased, but, but right, now that we have a lot of interesting candidates, it, it will be good uh, to, to go the other way around and then ask, you know, how predictive is that? If we can, if we look at specific variants and specific enhancers, can we then now predict, you know, specific features? Thank you. We, we would keep talking forever with you. Thank you so much for taking it. We'll do one, one last question from Haifan. You are not great talk, amazing work. Um, I wonder um, for those extra long distance enhancers, such as the distal enhancer clusters that are more than one megabases away mm -hmm. from SARS-9. In this case, do you think it's still important that they are in cysts? Have you ever yeah. tried to translocate or you know, move a fragment of uh, such clusters to another chromosome to see if they still work? I mean, we haven't in this work, but I think there's, this is a really very compelling evidence that even at those large distances that the regulation is in cysts. And, and uh, I guess also, I mean, uh, yeah, I think we, we can definitely say that in, I mean, anymore, definitely but. because we actually to, to link the enhancer and the gene expression. So we definitely know that in our heterozygous lines, it's in cis because we faced, we, <laughs> we faced the H9 genome to be able to, 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 to know for sure which enhancer you know, which enhancer deletion goes with, with, with sort of which allele. Uh, and, and so, yeah, it's definitely in cis in, in, in this case. But also I think there's really, I mean, other than obviously you're coming from Drosophila, so you guys have right. transvection. Yeah, yeah <laughs> so, so I was thinking in this way, why they need to be in cis. They, 
<laughs> right? So in Drosophila, because you have transvection, you, 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 yeah, know, exactly. you have chromosomal pairing, there are really compelling examples where it can be in trans. But in mammalian systems, there's really no compelling evidence that it could be in trans. Thanks. Wonderful. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Isoska. Um, and thank you everyone for attending. And uh, now we'll have our, our meetings with students and postdocs and some of the faculty. Thank you so much for your talk. Thank right. you. See you soon. Bye.